Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Hal, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Hal. We, uh... Had a short drive this morning. We come all the way. How many people know where Banning is? That's damn near any link to get it, to come to here. I'll tell you that right now. About to, <laughs> close to 100 miles. And, uh, well, a good part, I woke up this morning and knew where I was. That was a big step in the right direction. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Patrice, who's been a great uh, host, or hostess, pardon me. She's a hostess. And uh, in finding or giving me directions here and greeting me. And as I walked in, your, in here today, the thing that I looked for all my life was right here in the meeting. I felt a part of. I felt happiness. I felt laughter. I felt joy. And when I came to AA, my life wasn't like that. I'll tell you that right now. And uh, I never planned to talk in AA because I'll give you the message in about three minutes and the rest of it will be out of the book, my opinion, or something about my life. <clears throat> the miracle happened to me in 1973. Uh, I had been in and out of AA for a couple of years, and I came back in 1973 in a hopeless state of mind and body. My wife was in a mental institution. My kids were taken away. It went to Washington to be in school because we had an unfit home. And I went to a meeting uh, and uh, back to AA. I'd, I'd been to AA before, but I came back. And uh, my wife ended up in a recovery home for alcoholic women in August of 1973. And they said when she went there, and, her, and my daughter sits here today, and she lived part of the story. <clears throat> and uh, to get a divorce, she'll never walk the streets free again as a result of alcohol and drugs. And that's what I was, was told. So in any case, uh, they were sent to Washington and... Uh, the night after they were gone, in fact, I'd been drinking. She told me a story that I forgot here. I, I should quit talking to her about the past. Because uh, <clears throat> I was still drinking. And this was one of my last days out drinking. I'd been out drinking half the night, and I don't know about the rest of you. I had hangovers that I could throw up the length of this room. I mean, to tell you, I mean, I, you know, some people, I'd see a guy drink a quart of whiskey and do just fine. You know, but I mean to tell you, I would get sick, sick. Uh, I'm kind of what you call a, uh, whatever type of drunk that I am, and maybe there's a few of those here tonight. You have the high bottom, the low bottom, the silk sheet, and uh, skid row and all that stuff. And I looked at my own case, and I think this is important because we need to know what kind of drunk we are. I'm what you call a daily periodic. Now, uh, <laughs> maybe there's a few of those there today, here today. I would daily drink and periodically disappear for two or three days, you know, and uh, uh, come, I come to in strange places, doing strange things with strange people. And uh, But anyway, uh, back to 1973, I, the day before I took the kids to the airport, I went out and drank that night, and I was really hungover, and I was driving them to the airport, and I don't remember this, so this is, I shouldn't tell the story, but it's a, it's a true story. I, I was, like I said, I got sick a lot, and I threw up all over the dashboard of my car. I guess I had a hell of a mess. And here I'm taking these three kids to the airport to go with relatives in Washington State to go to school, and that's where my life was. You know, I had a hopeless state of mind and body. I'd been around. I'd tried everything, and I didn't think Alcoholics Anonymous was a hell of a lot to shoot for. So I drove back to, from the airport, and the day after that, or a day within a... You ever have those first few weeks in, in AA, you're, you're so, so confused, you're not sure exactly what order it was. But I know my last drunk was the day before Labor Day 1973. Because on the Sunday before Labor Day, I went to visit her mom, uh, my first wife's name was Lee, in a little recovery home in Covina called Stepping Stones. There were six gals there, and uh, she was there, and, and you know, in a hopeless state of mind and body, as I already said. And I went in to see her, and I looked at her, and this was a miracle. I said, Lee, the insanity has left your eyes. And then she told me about her deep-seated spiritual experience 
in Metro, Metropolitan State Hospital in Norwalk, in a woman's latrine, how she got on her hands and knees. And she had tried, we tried it all. Christ, we went to church, I've been baptized, I did it all trying to, you know, it's an amazing thing with this disease of alcoholism. It's the only disease in the world that I know of that my mind told me again and again and again I didn't have the thing. Isn't that something how we, it's, in, it's insane is what it is. And, and it's a twofold disease for the newcomer. It's, it's an allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind. And once the allergy sets in and the, or the obsession sets in and you take a drink, I mean, you, you can't predict your behavior. And, that's, uh, and I didn't know that. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. But in any case, she told me this story. And I looked at her, and something had happened to her when she had this deep-seated spiritual experience, like our founder, Bill, did. Well, in any case, I went back to the meeting that night, a Sunday night. We had a little outside meeting and uh, where she was staying, and I heard the speaker, and I actually heard what he said. My ears actually opened. There's an old guy that's gone now named Chuck C., and I love the man. He said, you can't see till you can see, and you can't hear till you can hear. And I couldn't see till I can see, and I couldn't hear till I could hear. But that night, I heard, I believe what the guy said, and I asked him to be my sponsor. And he gave me conditions to be, for to be my sponsor. He said, you got to be willing to go to any length, not to drink. I mean, he meant any length. It was one of these, you ever have a sponsor to pound on your chest like this? And I stayed sober on a resentment for six months at that old, old guy, you know. But, but anyhow, I actually believed what he said, and I did what he told me. He said to memorize the first three steps and say them out loud every day in the third step prayer. And I said, Walt, you don't understand. I used to talk to myself when I drank. He says, it doesn't matter. And to this day, most of the time, and I didn't do it today because Becky was with me, I have a little dog, uh, Maggie. She's 12 years old. In fact, uh, She's 12 years sober. She's sober more than some of the people in this room. But anyway, and then we have Harry over here with 13 years in Al-Anon, this dog right over here, see? So what I'm saying, my life's kind of went to the dogs is what's happened. But uh, this little dog actually sleeps in bed with me at night. And uh, people question that, but that's life, you know. So uh, uh, anyway, that has nothing to do with the story, but I thought I'd give it that report. So... But in any case, uh, I went to the meeting that night, and I got a sponsor, and I started doing what he said, and there was a little gal here with a year sober. Uh, that's what I did. I went to meetings every day, and uh, as Becky knows, her, her mom went to 30 days in the recovery home, and was ready to get divorced, and we made a decision to try it again sober. And I'd like to tell you, we came into Alcoholics Anonymous and walked up in Sunset uh, and just felt happily ever after. And that's bullshit. That's what that is. We came into Alcoholics Anonymous with all these problems. I don't know about the rest of you. I had big problems. I had financial problems. I had emotional problems. I had job problems. I had all these big problems. And then I'd go to my sponsor, Walt. HFC is going to come and get my furniture. And he'd say, easy does it. And I said, what the hell has that got to do with it? You know. And then he'd say, I'd ask him something else. He'd say, go to a meeting, or first things first. And I couldn't relate to what that meant at the time, because when you got all these heavy-duty problems, it's called self-centeredness. You know, today, self-centeredness is, is the root of my problem today. But in any case, I took his direction. I started going to meetings. And to this day, 38 years plus later, I'm still going to the meetings. <clears throat> like I said earlier, we got up early this morning, and it was a long drive out here, about 100 miles. And I got here, and they were happy, and, and everybody was having a good time. And what I started to say before, if I didn't finish, there's a feeling right here in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous this morning. Now, if you got that feeling, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you don't, one day you'll be sitting in these means, and all of a sudden you'll get that feeling. And that feeling to me is love. It's the love of one alcoholic for another. We're willing to go to any length to help each other if you're willing to go to any length to accept the help. And that's the amazing thing here. We try to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And the message that I, was, I have today as I was beating around the bush to tell you is by going to meetings and doing these things and becoming a part of and all my life I wanted to be a part of, 
is the obsession, the compulsion, or the desire, or the craving to drink or anything has been removed, and this, to this day it's never come back. Now, I've had about every other obsession you can think of. You know, you take an inventory and you do these things. And But anyway, I, I'm going to give you about 10 min minutes of what it used to be like, because I think it's important for the newcomers and some of us that have been here for a while. When I was drinking, I had a tendency to lose my car. Can I see the hands of the car losers here now? How many car losers are here? I don't remember a part of this because I, had, I was in a blackout, but I do remember the end result. One night, in a short sleeve shirt, somebody picked me up off the side of the street, and I come to out of a blackout. And I looked up, and all I seen was flashlight. And uh, then a voice. And the voice says, what are you doing? And I don't know about you, when you come out of a blackout, I didn't know where the hell I was, let alone what I was doing. So I thought, and I thought, and of course it was the police, you know, they don't, they don't, I'm not, there was a police officer I talked to. Is that you? Yeah. Somebody was here. <laughs> you know what they look like. There's one right there. But anyhow. <laughs> so he asked me, so, so he asked me this question, what are you doing? And I told him the best truth I could, I was taught to tell the truth. I said, I'm looking for my car. <laughs> and of course, there was a long, long pause. Then he asked me another. Quite all I do is ask questions. Remember that? When you, and, uh, maybe I shouldn't have told the story today. But anyhow, anyhow uh, he, he says, "What kind is it? And what color is it?" And oh God, I thought and I thought and I thought. You know. <laughs> and the best thing I could do that night under those conditions is tell him the truth. I don't know. <laughs> But I know I'm looking for it. And I went to jail that night for a drunken public. And, and yes? Uh, I guess somebody's blocking his car in. Well, sit down. It will be about 50 minutes. It won't take long. You, know. you got it? Okay. Anyway, so I went to jail for drunken public. So that's one of the things. And I had another problem out there. I drove these freeways for a living for many, many, many years. And uh, can I see the hands of the car wreckers? How many car wreckers have we got here today? And uh, I shouldn't tell this story. This threw me off to have the cop right here in front of me today, but nice to meet you. But anyway, uh, uh, I flipped this car over on an off-ramp and blocked the off-ramp drunk on a Saturday afternoon. This is getting, Becky remembers this. And uh, I, I and I don't know about the rest of you, and I shouldn't say this, but but this is my story, and we're anonymous. Remember that. But uh, <laughs> I blocked the off ramp, and I called. How many window crawlers have we got here today? By the way, <laughs> crawled out of the window, and uh, of course the people were coming around. Are you okay? Blah blah blah. You know how they are now. My point is, in my alcoholism years, man, I was op operating on fear and emotion, and adrenaline, and you know how we are. And I said, I'm fine, thank you. And I looked at my car, and the hood was smashed in real bad, uh, but the car looked pretty good. And I said, I'm fine, thank you. Would you help me turn my car over? <laughs> so we flipped that baby back onto the four wheels, and he wasn't here yet. He hadn't got there. But anyway, uh, uh, I'm a runner, and that's I'm ashamed to say that, but in my drinking days, once you've been to jail and had problems, uh, it's a shame, but that's that was what I did. I didn't stay around. I would take off if I could. So I crawled back in the window. I turned it on. It started right up. And, of course, I got an audience by all people because the cars couldn't get by. And I looked over at them, and I said, thank you very much. There I went, you know. And, and uh, so anyhow, I'm driving this baby home. The sparks are flying. You know how you are. And you got about this much windshield. And I pulled into my yard. This is when we lived in Azusa. Becky remembers pulled that baby in my yard, crawled out of the window, and passed out in the grass. Home, there he is. He, the old, all the neighbors come out, you know, when you have this. We used to have the police come, the ambulances come. Becky can remember this. And, and in fact, when we got sober, 
they said, since you quit drinking, there's nothing going on in the neighborhood. You know, and <laughs> and uh, been sober about six years. Remember this, Becky, and a guy ran into a tree drunk. I was the first one out. He's over there, you know, so <laughs> to get the heat off of me, you know, so. <laughs> I'm going to back up just a little further. I'm going to get sober here in a minute because this is a, we've got birthdays coming up here. When I married Becky's mom in 1959, I came back from overseas. I had two years in Japan, and I was drunk probably more than I was sober. And again, the insanity of this disease, I never once thought I was an alcoholic, but as the disease progressed, I knew I was crazy because I did crazy things, and I did stuff. I mean, I would be doing just fine, and all of a sudden that compulsion would hit me, and, and you know, then you get a problem, and the problem gets a problem, and it builds, and it builds. So when I, when I met her mom, I come back from overseas. I said, okay, I've been in trouble. I've had problems, uh, so I'll get married. And her mom and I had three dates. I didn't want to overdo the courtship. And uh, on the third date, we got engaged, and I went to Albany, Georgia. And uh, I'm, I'm originally from Washington State. I lived on the coast up there, San Juan Islands. I uh, came to California, and uh, or before I came to California, we went to Georgia. And I married her, and we drove to Georgia, and I promised her one thing. She said, promise me you won't drink. And I meant it. I said, I will never drink again. I promised. And she says, by the way, and, and Becky's mom is Irish. There was an Irish gal here someplace there, right there. They get pissed real easy, you know, pardon the expression. They have a bad temper sometimes. My language sometimes gets the best of me. Anyway, so uh, I'd been married about 10 days, and I was in the service. And one of my little friends says, how about a drink? And the next thing I was drinking... I come home to my little apartment in Albany, Georgia, and walked into the door of this new little wife, and she kicked the shit out of me. And I thought to myself, if that's a little temper problem, I hope she never gets too upset. And uh, so that started what we called 14 years of alcoholic bliss, drinking and fighting, and it was really a mess. And so this went on for about six months. I would come home and, and, and see, I the insanity is, I broke the promise right off the bat. But the crazy part is, if I want to drink, I have that right, don't I? See, so it's funny. This is all in retrospect because when we're, when we're out there, we don't know, isn't it? We get all these mixed up feelings. We're looking, there's a, when we talk in our program about a spiritual experience, I was looking for a spiritual experience for years because I knew there was something terribly wrong. But who do you go to and tell them you're going crazy or you don't understand your feelings? I was a, we went to therapy. I spent thousands of dollars, and I told the therapist, it's got nothing to do with my mother. In other words, you know, they, he, I couldn't be honest about my problem. But in any case, finally I told uh, Lee, I says, listen, we've been married about six months, and we're going to have a change. Now, I'm going to drink. Now, if you want to drink with me, fine. Or if you don't want to drink with me, in those days, we didn't have transportation like we do now. I'm going to put you on the Greyhound bus and send you back to Washington, and we'll call this a deal. She says, okay, I'll drink with you. So we started drinking together, and she used to tell this story right here from the podium. She'd say we'd be out in the bar, going along drinking, doing just fine. And she'd look over at me, and something about me just pissed her off. And... Uh, of course, you know the rest of the story, and uh, so we, you know, so wherever we went, we, of course, we were the first one there. So eventually, we went back to Washington, and then I worked for a radio station. I got drunk one night and, and didn't show up at home, but I showed up for work. And she come up to the station, and this little station still there, and uh, I could see her coming into the station about six on a Sunday morning. Now I'm the type of an alcoholic. Many times I should have not went to work, but my dad worked in a lumber mill for 44 years, and he taught me to be a worker, work hard, and be honest. I didn't have any religious training, but that always stuck with me. To this day, I've always been a good worker, and I, I believe I'm really honest now. In my drinking days, I was as honest as I could be, because many times in my drinking days, I told a lie when the truth would have probably been better. you know. But anyway... 
here she comes up to this radio station, and I can see her out of the one window, and you got those little bitty eyes, you know how they get when they're all upset, and she come into the station and physically knocked me off the air, and in those days it was manual, to everything's computers, but anyhow, we were on the air in the whole county of Skagit County on a Sunday morning when I was playing religious tapes, and... Uh, <laughs> The language was below average, and uh, <laughs> so the next day I came to California where people were a little more broad-minded, and uh, so in any case, uh, I came to California, then in 1960 I've been here in California ever since. In the essence of time, I'm just going to kind of skip forward. We had 14 really bad years. And as it got towards the end, the kids would see the ambulances come, the police would come, and it was a very, very sick situation. And I didn't know what to do, and they didn't know what to do, and nobody knew what to do. And in 1971, I was drinking in Pasadena and come out of a blackout in Las Vegas. And uh, so I never went long distance before, so it scared me. Uh, and these I did not know, how many knew a blackout was part of drinking, part of alcoholism? How many knew that before you came here? Not very, I never remember waking up on a Sunday morning like this drunk or hung over and going to the bar and saying, uh, uh, Laura, what time did you black out last night? Uh, I never, you know, I never heard that come up. I did not know a blackout was part of alcoholism. But anyhow, I had this bad experience. And for some reason, when I came back, I called Alcoholics Anonymous. This is 1971, and I made the call, and a little Mexican guy named Julian come out and took us to our first meeting. Becky probably remembers this, too. And we went to the meeting with the couple, Betty and Gordon, and who was my wife's first sponsor. And uh, we went to some meetings, and then we ended up at a club, not like this, 502 Club, and they can say what they want about it. I didn't have a real good experience in my early days because... There's a halfway measures room, and there's a meetings. So we figured the halfway measures room was easier. Well, anyhow, we had a bad experience there. I got a resentment, and I went out and got drunk again And uh, because I said AA wouldn't work. It wasn't AA. I'm the problem. I've learned in AA, no matter what it is, it's me or my reaction too. So we ended up back out there again, and... And this is a short meeting, or I'm a slow talker. I don't know which of you, but anyhow, um, ended up back out there again. And uh, just before her mom had this nosedive that I've already told about, I had tried everything, and I had a neighbor, a neighbor named George who died of, of our disease, I would say. Anyhow, across the street, he'd been to AA with me before, and he said, Hal, I quit drinking. I said, my God, George, what have you done? He said, I've taken up pot. I said, pot, marijuana, somehow I'd missed that. In our, my era, it was way different. And he said, well, come on over, I'll show you. So we pulled the blinds. I don't know if Becky remembers this story or not. But anyhow, he's, we pulled the blinds, and he brought out the pot. And, we, and I used to have to wear a tie like this and shirt, remember, Becky? Anyhow, so I was like this over at George's, finding this new way not to drink. And uh, see, he rolls this, rolls this baby up and uh, fires it off, and I'm working on this damn thing, and the seeds are popping, I had holes in my shirt, and I'm going to have a time, and I uh, keep waiting for the, something to happen. And all I was doing was <coughs> getting a dry throat and holes in my shirt. And, uh, and I told George, I says, I don't see, this is a pain in the ass to do this, you know. So here he says, let me show you. So he gave me this little short one with the tweezers. If you're, I know, Maybe you're not many pop smokers, but anyhow. You get these little short ones with the tweezers up there, and he says, that's the best part. Of it. I'm burning the hell out of my lips. <laughs> and, uh, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we had a little pool table. I looked over there, and I shit, I studied that cue ball for about three days. <laughs> And uh, so anyhow, and I felt like I was in slow motion. That's what happened to me. Now, I don't know that much about it. You know, the experts are here. I'm a novice. And uh, so this is only my story. So anyhow, I was going along there and everything. And I says, George, I'm getting so darn dry. I can't, 
I don't know about, the, I, I mean, I've never been that dry. It's like sandpaper in my throat. Yeah, you holding your throat, do you? Are you one of those too? Right there. There's one right here. But anyhow, so, <clears throat> and so I says, I don't care, George. I got to go to the liquor store, get me something to drink. So I went to my car, and it seemed like I couldn't hardly. Finally got to my car. I got, I got on the freeway. I had about a mile to the liquor store. Remember where it was down on Grand? But anyhow. <laughs> So I'm going down the freeway, and the cars are going, <laughs> going 16 miles an hour, for Christ's sake. So I get to the liquor store. I goes back home, and uh, I got two big bottles. If everybody remembers Thunderbird, anybody remember Thunderbird? What's the word, Thunderbird? I think they pulled one grape through it, you know. So, And uh, I drink two bottles of that, and uh, my throat got less dry. And I looked through the blinds across the street to my house. And Becky remembers this. My T-shirts and shorts was in the trees. And I said, George, I'm not going home tonight. And uh, so anyhow, not long after that, we hit another bottom. And as I've already said before, uh, the end result was AA. And uh, 1973, we started our journey. And uh, 1975, I had what I call my spiritual experience. Through the grace of God and a number of circumstances, uh, I was given the opportunity to go to the Palomesa retreat with Chuck and 60-some other guys. Uh, it's called a new, it's a book, it's not an AA book, a new pair of glasses. <clears throat> I'm one of those 60-some guys, and Chuck had the original book, and the original book, it, it's a lot different than the, the edition we have now. The original book, it says if you've read the book through and you're not convinced you're an alcoholic, read back to this certain place, and if you're still not convinced, throw the book away. I mean, it was no bullshitting around those days, you know, so. But anyhow, I went to that retreat with Chuck, and when he talked, because I'd been baptized. I got baptized once, wanting this spiritual experience. I went down in the water, and I come up out of the water waiting for the spiritual experience, and all I felt was wet. Nothing happened, you know, so. But anyway, uh, so I went to that retreat, and I found a God on my very own. I believe today we're all God's kids. I don't care who you are, where you come from, how you got here, how you did it. I believe this is a gift from God. I believe I've been given this gift of sobriety. And my message today is I already said I showed up sober. You showed up sober. And it's a sharing, one with the other, with love. And it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> and I was talking to a gal before the meeting. There's one that I like a lot, Rule 62. Don't take yourself so darn serious. And I have a tendency to do that. And uh, the ability to laugh at me, because I'm a joke a lot of the time. Uh, those that know me in my home group, I the highest rank we get is sober today. But I really believe by staying here all these, these years and working with others and trying to carry the message to the alcohol suffers, who still suffers. I got three words that I look for all my life. Three words. And it's in the book more than once. What I looked for all my life was peace of mind. I feel okay today. I feel good about myself. Now, I've got cancer now. I've had two open heart surgeries and uh, damn near died. I've had three heart attacks. Becky's seen me survive them. On the second open heart surgery, there's people here that used to go to the Upland Friday night group, a few of you. I used to go to that meeting too. And uh, when I come out of my second surgery and I woke up and up on the wall, almost as big as this sign in big meat paper. It said, he took a licking and kept on ticking. And uh, about 80 people signed it. And what is that? Love is fulfillment of the law. The love of one alcoholic for an another. The love of one person for another. The love of a dog. The love of life. You know, we go out into life and practice these principles in all of our affairs. At home, at work, at play in AA. I try to be an example of good kindness and love. When I say I walk my dog and say the first three steps, the thing I got to remember, I'm powerless over alcohol. I'll always be powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable, my me. No human power can relieve my alcoholism. God could and would, and I was told I better get my ass to seek him. And uh, I believe that God's right here. I believe that God's in this room today. I believe that he never left me. I left him. I really believe that. But the feeling, when I walked in the room, the most excitement I've had today is just sitting here and feeling the feeling that we have an Alcoholics Anonymous. 
and the ability for one with the other from all walks of life to try and help one another. What the hell else can I say? I don't have any big super message. I have one story, and my story is I came here 38 years ago through the grace of God with all the stuff that's happened. I survived. I got a daughter here that I love very much. We had a big thrill last night. We went to In-N-Out Burger. Now, by God, and she got all this paraphernalia to send. I got three grandsons, one in pre-med, one in college, and one as a junior. These three boys, she's given me three beautiful sons. I have another daughter who's got two years plus sober, and I watched my second daughter, her oldest daughter, her sister, in her alcoholism go through the windshield of a car and was almost killed. And that night I cried. I thought, why her, God? Why not me? I don't know why. See, it isn't why. It's if I'm doing these things, if I've given of myself and expecting nothing in return, trying to do the right thing, life is life. I don't know why I have cancer. And I'll tell you one other thing about me. And I've been here a long time. Patience isn't my long suit. You know, patience, my ass, I want to kill somebody. I like that one. You know, and I've been waiting for the results of this MRI my daughter said I should have had it in three or four days. Not me. 18 days I waited for that thing. And I was on I made an ass of myself a few times, I thought. But on the other hand, I really didn't because I wanted to know the answer. See, I'm not good on weight. But you know, there's this, there's a saying in the book, restrain a tongue and pen. And I have trouble with that sometimes. Go out into life and be kind and loving and not try and hurt anybody, including yourself. Try and do that for a whole day. My first sponsor died. I had a guy named Deke till he died. He was the most kind and loving man I ever had in my life. He was like a father to me that I never had. I remember my dad only one time in my whole life telling me that he loved me. And he was laying in a hospital, almost dying from a heart attack. And I flew up north. And I said to Deke, I don't know what to say to him. I have had no relationship with my dad. He told me to drink like a man, and I did my very best and ended up in AA. But he was, And he said, well, just sit there and tell him you love him. So I sat there in the hospital some years ago, 1987, with my dad, and I told him I loved him. And, and finally I said, Dad, i got to go back. I had my own business. Becky, remember, she worked for me. On her 21st birthday, i got to tell a story on her. On her 21st birthday, she was my, took care of my accounts receivable and help me on her 21st birthday and she's kind of a you know not a big worldly girl anyhow I had a stripper come over and <laughs> and uh, she still got I, and it was her mom was there and, and he didn't like strip all the way down but you know she got her money's worth I'll tell you that right now but <laughs> but but, but uh, <laughs> didn't do much for me but what the hell you know so uh, but the point of the story is make a fun thing out of it. You know, let's, let's have a good time today. Let's be grateful. We're going to go down here after this big, long drive and have something to eat, put it around a little bit. And, uh, uh, oh, i got to tell i got two minutes. Her first, my first wife, her mom, come from further than me, I think, because there was no hope. And she died sober, 19 years sober. She went from the mental institution. She always wanted to get in law enforcement. This is for you. She be no this no this. She was about five two, and if I ever started drinking again, I'd leave town. I tell you that right now. And she was the first woman jailer for the city of Monrovia. That was her goal. She became the first woman jailer, and what a lovely from from and the, and we actually got along. Her mom loved parrots, didn't she, Becky? We had one parrot named Pogo. He had about a hundred word vocabulary. I taught him all these dirty poems. He used, to, and uh, honest to God, she had an obsession with parrots. And uh, Becky and I had to clean cages all the time. But this parrot used to say, I'm going to tell you one poem. There once was a man from Grant's Pass whose balls were made out of brass. When they clanged together, they played stormy weather. And lightning shot out of his ass. That's how he would do it. <laughs> and all the neighbor kids would come over and they say, Are you open the day, Mr. Taylor? You know, to, to listen to the parrots. So that's what, I, what I'm saying. It's life, it's a fun thing. Make a fun thing out of it. And uh, 
So anyway, I know it's birthday day today, and uh, I'm very, very grateful. And it's been a host and hostess. Everybody's been so friendly. Uh, your coffee's better than some of my meetings. Uh, no, it's great coffee. And uh, I could tell you a coffee maker story, but I'm out of time. Uh, bottom line, go out each day, be kind and loving, and not hurt anybody yourself. I know I repeated that, but that's a big one. Big one. But the last thing I want to say, and I use this one a lot too, the smartest things I say and do are the things I don't say and do. Many times the answer is just keep my mouth shut. I'm not as good as I should be. But I, I, lastly, I'm going to say, for all God's kids, I love you very much, and thanks for letting me come out. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.